Okay, so yeah, look, um, I'll get into the project and, and so on in, um, in just a second, but it's, it's the Longitudinal Spine of Government Functions, that's the project name, um, and essentially we're linking functional classifications of government for a few purposes. Okay, I'm going to progress. There we go. Okay, so the very quick outline. Uh, I'm going to talk about the goals of the project, the sources of data, and that's when I'll bring David in because um, the National Archives is one of the sources. Um, approaches to concept mapping, um, and then just a little, a couple of other interesting bits about um, mapping governance and some technical systems that we're using. Um, I've got a bunch of additional slides sort of at the end of the project. If anybody's interested in more detail about, in particular, term versioning, um, and um, how to actually create RDF from non-RDF sources. Oh, and I should mention that with me uh, in the room here in, in uh, Brisbane, not that you can perhaps see him, is uh, Jake, who's a student from Griffith University doing all things semantic web. Okay, um, so very quickly, the Longitudinal Spine Project's goal is to really improve queries about federal government structure and the functions of government uh, structural units. And some of the example kinds of queries that are possible now, but that we want to enhance, so make them more effective, quicker to execute and so on, are uh, queries like this. After a particular change in government, list all the matters, each matter and their responsible portfolios. So a matter is a, a functional classification of the government according to the administrative arrangement orders, uh, which are a government uh, uh, issued kind of structure of government uh, 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 instruction. Um, and so second query might be find all the portfolios, so government portfolios responsible for a particular matter over a 10 year period. So again, this is entirely possible now, but it's very difficult, a lot of manual work. Um, and then finally, another kind of example query is uh, find the National Archives of Australia's record series or multiple series for agencies carrying out the function veterans entitlements, uh, which might also be called war pensions in a different vocabulary or perhaps a narrower term, Siemens War Pensions. So there's different ways of referring to that same term and we wanna get all the results. So who's involved? So currently, or well, currently, the project is a Platforms for Open Data uh, DIPA project, so all these acronyms, but they're spelled out there. Uh, is the technical uh, partner and the lead of the project. And then the clients and partners are the Department of Finance and National Archives um, both are interested in the results of the project and both um, contain significant sources of, of data um, that are being uh, dealt with in the project. Um, and why is this a vocabularies project and semantics project? Well, some of the functions in government are already listed as um, semantic vocabularies um, and there's a lot of term def uh, overlaps and definitions that need alignment and so on. Okay, so very quickly, the, the framing of the data used in this project, we've got government entities, so these are agencies, they have different words in different data sets, but you know, units of government, um, and they're assigned government functions, and the functions can come be legal functions, they can be policy, you know, there's a whole range of ways you might establish these functions and describe them. Um, and both the government entities and the government functions change over time, and that just makes things difficult. Uh, but that's the way it is. Um, now, the data sets that we're using in particular in this project, it's the Australian Government Organisations Register, AGOR, that's the Department of Finance. The collection of administrative arrangement orders over time, so that's, that's really, I guess, um, issued by Prime Minister and Cabinet. Not quite sure who owns it per se, but the National Archives have got them all listed um, as uh, um, you know, PDF documents, and then we've text mined those. Um, the Commonwealth Records Series database, that's a database that contains information about Commonwealth persons and agencies and their changes over time and the records that um, they've, they've produced. So you can find things like, you know, all of the documents that John Howard made and also all the documents that um, pertain to particular functions um, over time as well. Um, and then finally, budget papers, which include instructions on how government spends money in functional units. Okay, so, so many of the data sources that we're using are already um, themselves public. So for instance, uh, the AGOR information comes out and is publicly available at directory.gov.au and on the left there you see just a landing, a web page for CSIRO as described in the directory.gov.au system. And on the right there in sort of the purple text box, uh, you can actually get a, um, a machine readable export of that information from data.gov.au. So that's the, 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 there are other ways to access other data sets, but most of the information we're dealing with is public already. 
Now, the, um, the vocabularies of government functions, um, there's things like the Australian Government Inter Interactive Functions Thesaurus, AGIF, from the National Archives. There's a couple of international ones. So COFOG is an international government functions classification vocabulary. Um, some internal ones like the Bureau of Statistics is uh, government purpose classification. And then the National Archives also have additional uh, systems such as the CRS thesaurus. Um, and then you, there are things which are not always thought of as vocabularies or functions, but sort of are for our purposes, such as um, ex uh, government expenses um, listed by purpose. Um, and then there's some derivative ones like COFOG A, which is an Australian government version of COFOG. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to David at National Archives and, I, and I'm, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to bring up his presentation and I'm going to see if I can click on the next slide for him as he tells me to. Because All I, right. Uh, Thank you, Nick. One second, David. I'll let you know when, uh, when we're on screen. Not a problem. I think we're getting it. Ah, uh, yes. Now, uh, so uh, Richard, or oh, sorry, not Richard, um, Rowan, can you just tell me if you can see David's presentation on the screen? Yes, yes, that's, that's fine, Nick. Okay, great. All right, David, we're looking at the first slide and fire away. Okay, so uh, before you, you should see a slide for the CRS system sitting on it with a very basic box diagram. Is that the one you've got there? It is now, yes. Excellent. Okay, so um, one of National Archives' fundamental roles is just to make the moment, National Archives... Just one moment, David. Um, in the camera yes. office, we're just seeing the first slide. All right, let me, uh, let me reshare. That's, I know I've seen this issue before. <laughs> okay, I'll stop and reshare. Okay, Rowan, let me know if things... Yes, we can see a, a, a record search screen now, the CRS system. Great. Excellent. Okay, good. All right, so one of National Archives' fundamental roles is to make the National Archives accessible to the public. And to support that, we chronicle the structure and functions of the Commonwealth of Australia um, by documenting the government uh, at um, a snapshot in time and then the changes of those structures and functions over time, and then link it all together by recording the entities of creation. That's in the diagram here, you'll see agencies, organisations, and Commonwealth persons, and linking these, these to the records that they create in accumulations of what, what we call series. They're effectively information management units. So um, we've got series and they, they're made up of individual items. They can be digital objects, they can be records, they can be um, files, pretty much anything, really. Um, this underpins one of our fundamental archival practices, and that is the documentation of provenance to authenticate the information we look after in the public interest. Now, the CRS system, which is more broadly known as the Australian Series System, is um, able to cope with frequent and uh, lots of administrative change by keeping these entities, as you see in the diagram, separate. So the entities of creation, separate from the units of, in, of the information that they create, and then linking those entities together over time. Um, this is actually quite different to how um, archives and public record offices operate elsewhere across the globe. Um, and we're actually slowly bringing the globe with us. So, and it's, it's 50 years in the making so far, and we're, we're still getting there. <laughs> um, so this means um, we can, uh, both the agencies and their records can be linked across time um, and accurately document the changing relationships between the agencies, between the information management units, the series and the items, and between the agencies and the series. Um, so that's a very broad and brief description of the entire system. There's um, a couple of links there that I've provided um, in the presentation um, to more information if you're interested. Um, so one of the simplified components, as you'll see in that box like game, is functions of government. Um, this has been represented in a number of ways by National Archives. 
um, each evolving for quite different reasons. <laughs> okay, so on to the next slide, Nick. Uh, CRF Sosaurus. Okay, you there. Cool. Um, right, so the thesaurus is pretty much a standard thesaurus which describes government functions. Um, it was developed to aid searching methodologies and tools for these provenance and records linkages. It was first introduced in 1991 uh, as part of the finding aid suite that we had at the time. Uh, it was last updated in 1999. Um, it's a list of what was then contemporary, so mid-90s, uh, broad and narrow terms that reflect the ma major functions and activities carried out by the Commonwealth Government agencies from 1901 to around the mid-90s. Um, okay, that's all I was going to say about the CRS most broadly. You'll see on the the the, uh, the slide there, that's, that's how it's uh, accessible to the public through our search engine called Record Search. Um, you can search on terms there and they link to agencies when you click on the relevant terms and from there you can link to the records themselves and away you go. Um, there is also a list of these functions in summary form. I'll provide a link to that available on our website. Um, that's pretty much it really. So it's it's a the the main strength of that thesaurus is that it actually provides some historicity to what it's describing. So it goes all the way back to nineteen oh one, as we found later, and I'll get to that with our gift. Um, there are a number of terms in there which effectively are no longer used in government. But that's valuable because of how, how government works, you get language shift, linguistic shift, and um, the boundaries of what functions actually are, they shift as well. So even though it's dated, it's still very useful. Okay, on to the next one. Um, yep. uh, Records Authority, Agency Specific Functions. Okay, so part of our work um, at National Archives is regulating the Archives Act permissions that allow government agencies to retain or destroy government information. We call these permissions records authorities and they include the retention and maintenance of National Archives records as well. Um, functions, um, the, 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 on the slide there you'll see uh, an example of one records authority. At the, the bottom of that page you'll see records covered. That's practically a functions list um, for that agency at the time it was issued to that agency. Um, the functions have been used to uh, classify agency business um, from around 1999 um, and we revised that methodology um, from around 2007 by effectively simplifying it but we still have the, these functions for each of these records authority permissions. Um, these functions are tied to the agency that the records authority gets issued to at the time of the issue. Um, so whenever there's a machinery government change um, over time with more changes in government we tend to lose a bit of track as to which agency is responsible for what. Um, this is the nature of how we do the um, permissions under the Archives Act. Um, the Business relevance of SEC records authorities is dictated by the speed of change of the agency business and of course significant change triggers the review process to update the, the permissions that are embedded in the records authority. Um, they also see on that slide there's some links to AGIF terms. Um, this is the place where we link records authority functions to top level AGIF terms. Um, so that's, that's a useful linkage to be made in terms of what AGIF is for, but I'll get, that in a, get to that in a second. Um, so the third data set that we have is AGIF itself. Um, that's on the next slide, Nick. Yep, we're there. Okay, so I'm assuming at least some of you will be more or less 
across what our gift actually is. Um, I provided some links to, to uh, provide some more explanation about that, but this is one of our more recent products. Um, it was initially developed in 1999, and for those of you that was around then, um, that was part of the Howard Governance Initiative to make everything digitally available for government services. Um, so there was a thing called a, the Australian Government Locator Service, which is now an Australian standard. Uh, it was made an Australian standard in 2010. Um, and that had uh, classifier elements um, for subjects and functions. Um, there wasn't um, made any particular difference between those two, but they were separate entities. A gift is the, the functions part of that. Um, for those of you who were familiar in the library world, um, they developed at the time something called TAGS, the source of Australian government subjects. Um, anyway, that was that's pretty much as old as the um, Sarah thesaurus. Um, so getting back to A gift, um, it describes a high level business functions carried out across Commonwealth, state and local governments in Australia. Uh, provides standard terms for government agencies to use as part of the AGLS system. So it's a resource locator um, aid. Improves the discovery, visibility and accessibility of online government resources. It was significantly revised in 2005 and we provided it in um, much more consumable form online um, a couple of years ago. Um, National Archives joined the Longitudinal Spine Project um, as a means of not so much keeping these vocabularies current, but um, being able to link these together and across other government vocabularies to uh, enhance our existing um, accessibility roles um, across time. Um, in this space, in terms of changes over time, uh, National Archives have realised we're pretty much the only government agency that actually uh, pays attention to the changes over time and have, and have actually documented it in some shape or form. That's that's effectively the CRS system. Um, these vocabularies that hang off that to a certain extent um, are, are what we have, but we know they are limited. Um, and we want to be able to link them across government. Um, and this spine project is providing a very exciting means of enabling that across uh, linked data systems right across government. Um, and we're starting with the, the finance data sets, but there's, there's many more out there. Um, our principal um, source of authority for most of this stuff starts with the AAOs, that's the Administrative Range and Orders. Um, and again, they've been manually analysed because there was no other way of doing it. Um, and the SPINE project is starting with AAOs to um, get them more machine consumable and make them more accessible. Um, and this is really good. And linking our vocabularies across SPINE um, is going to help us in our work and, and across government as well. Uh, what we would like to do is maintain these um, data sets that the SPINE project is generating uh, to continue to make them available um, for reuse in, in a machine usable form, which of course they're, they're not at present because they're effectively sitting on our website, apart from a gift, which is, is available in a number of different formats, as you'll see when you follow the linkages. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say at this stage. So back to Nick. Thanks, David. Okay, now I'm gonna do the switcheroo back to my presentation, folks. And let's see, I have to stop sharing and reshare very quickly, but it should be back in just a moment. Okay, so Rowan, please yell, scream, and otherwise indicate whether you could, when you can see my presentation. <laughs> Yeah, we can see that we can see it, uh, but not in presentation mode. We could. Right. Uh, that, that will be kicking in about now, hopefully. Yeah, that looks good. Thanks, Nick. Okay, so we've moved to the beginning, but I'll just zoom back to where we were. All right.
Okay. Okay. So, so that's so you've got an overview of uh, an organisation there that's got a lot of vocabulary, some of which are in the forms that we can that we like to use, and others which are not. Um, but before we get into some technical details, very briefly about fiddling around with formats, um, let's talk about approaches to concept mapping generally. Okay. So for vocabularies that are stored in a semantic form, and, and the particular semantic form that we mean is. Uh, is SCOS, this, um, I think it's a format really to all. And when I say semantic form, I mean a form where the individual elements um, of the vocabularies have um, identity and, and have um, uh, named relations between the parts. So if we've got two vocabularies in a SCOS form or similar form, we can assert, we can call it deliberate mapping, um, we can assert mappings just between them. So we can say, you know, defense in one functional vocabulary is equivalent or is an exact match of defense in another one or, or something like that. Um, and when we do that, uh, we get um, inferred mappings as well, where, you know, sub terms of defense in one become sub terms of the, whatever the defense equivalent is in the other. And so for the, for the kinds of vocabularies we're dealing with in, in longitudinal spine, this is the main way we're going to do mapping because um, at the high level, I should say, because, you know, we're only talking half a dozen, a dozen vocabularies of um, tens to, to hundreds of terms. It's not, not like they're not vocabularies of many thousands of terms. So we have, or we will make um, deliberate mappings between these vocabularies. So the second way we might do this um, vocabulary mapping though is a more interesting way and the way long spines set up to operate, which is where we have data sets such as uh, collections of government organizations um, that classification X and classification Y are mapped to, um, then we can start to infer mappings between these vocabulary terms. And David showed a little bit of that before. There was a, a deliberate mapping between the, um, the lower level records disposal authority uh, functions and the higher level AGIFT um, terms. So that's a deliberate mapping, but the data set that contains the total collection of agencies and their record series and so on um, kind of contains all of the above, deliberate mappings and this, um, these, these sort of uh, indirect mappings between uh, where different systems have been used, different classification systems have been used to classify the same data set over time. And so you can see how we would just say that, you know, 80% of the time when you see defense in the blue column, it equates to, you know, defense and other things in the red column. Um, and, and that kind of mapping is emergent um, from the data when we've collected it in the way we're planning on doing. Okay. Now, um, mapping governance. All right, so the sources of the data that we're using, the vocabularies themselves are fairly uncontroversial. As I indicated before, most are already published. Most have single owners. So the National Archives have this data set, finance have this data set, et cetera. Um, but the mappings between these data sets are potentially contentious because um, people can have different interpretations of how terms map. And these are necessarily multi-owner things when you're doing a mapping because you've got, well, not necessarily, often they are, where you've got two data sets, you're doing a mapping between them, and the, each data set is a different owner. Um, so what we're doing, um, and we're doing this in many projects, but um, we're, we're publishing mappings between standalone data sets um, as individual data sets themselves, and we call those link sets. Um, so they're specialized data sets that just do mappings, um, and the link sets are used instead of mappings within a vocab. So we don't have a vocabulary of terms, and then within there you see mappings like, you know, I'm uh, term another vocabulary. Instead, the vocabulary is a bit standalone. Um, that's not always the case. Some of them already contain mappings. That's fine. Um, but when we're creating new mappings, we, we put them as separate linking vocabularies. Um, and then the users of the project's data are able to include or exclude individual link sets from analysis um, uh, as they go. So they can say, I want to do a, such and such a query. Oh, and by the way, you know, I prefer to use these link sets rather than those ones, something like that. Um, now, just a, a, a small uh, indication as to where these link sets and things come from. So the Loki project, another link data project, which is not specifically vocabulary based, um, it has a concept of link sets too, um, that links spatial data sets together. And here you see the Loki's um, overarching model um, that if you could be bothered to follow, follow all the arrows, you can see that it's got data sets, it's got link sets, link sets are kinds of data sets. Um, it doesn't say it in words, but the link sets are for yeah, mapping between other data sets. And we're reusing that same link set concept. Um, we have different types of information that we're linking between compared to low key project, but the, the, function, the, the functional place of a link set is the same. And what's inside the link set? So I'm not gonna explain this in great depth, but you see a series here of four 
little chunks of information. Each of those is a link expressed in an odd way uh, between two items um, with qualifications in, those, in that linking. And that's what the link sets contain, long list of these kinds of mappings. Um, now, this is from the Loki project, this uh, particular example, but this is what a link set looks like. There's a written description of what it is. Um, and there's a bunch of files which we've published which actually contain those mappings. And the Loki project's published nine or so link sets, so the, a set of them that you can see there. And the Longitudinal Spine project is going to publish a certain number of link sets. We're not quite sure how many yet, but it's, it's wherever we've got an assertion of mappings between either two functional vocabulary um, vocabularies or um, data sets. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to whip through this bit very quickly. And if people are interested, I can stay on the line and just go to town on the technical information. And I've got a series of slides after the end of this presentation that contain more technical goodies. Um, so for, uh, for a quick note on for vocabularies that are not themselves already in uh, RDF or semantic form, we just go through a little process of getting them there. And we've just done this with the CRS thesaurus that David mentioned, where we've taken uh, the concepts. Now, they are available online, but they're also available in the relational database table. Uh, we've dumped them into Excel. We've used formula to fiddle around with them and, um, and to um, extract bits and pieces. And we've dumped that to a file, and then we've validated and normalized that file. Um, again, if you want to see the actual steps laid out, I can show them at the end. Um, we're using a single da triple store database, which is an RDF database, to contain all the databases and vocabularies implemented in the project. This makes querying easy, and we're using the GraphDB product. There's many different uh, open source and commercial triple stores out there. GraphDB is, is initially a free one, and it also has a commercial version. Um, and we just, we just try different products from time to time, and in this project, we're using GraphDB. Um, that's what it looks like. This is the technical interface to manipulate or to manage the data. And what you see there is a series of individual graphs of information that are stored within the database. And so you can think of the graph as a database schema, like an individual schema within a total database. And if you look carefully, you can see things like AGIFT, CRS, etc. in there. Um, and we're making a queryable UI, sorry, a query UI to grant technical access to all of the information that Longspine generates. It looks something like this. Um, you can drop Sparkle queries in there and access all the data in all the graphs that we just saw in the last couple of slides. And we're developing example queries now so that people can know the kinds of queries we think they might want to run. And of course, so they can innovate on top of that and make their own. And finally, we're now entering into building specialized clients for exploration and visualization of the data. Uh, this is just a one out of the box uh, with GraphDB, but it's the kind of thing that uh, Richard spent a lot of time building for ARDC uh, to let people click through um, complex structured data. Future work, data mining across our data sets and vocabularies to try and establish some of those statistical links that um, uh, will, will emerge. Um, making of exemplar queries, client development, and then ultimately tools to allow other people to create link sets across government functions and organizations units so that we don't have to do them every time that they might want to do them themselves. Okay, so that's the formal end of my presentation.